And uh, <coughs> uh, just to kind of connect to yesterday, this was the view that I'm going to take in this talk, in these in this, uh, two lectures. Basically, we are thinking about algorithmic high dimensional geometry. From Sorry, there is some <laughs> delayed. Uh, Sorry. Uh, okay. Uh, through the prism of nearest neighbor search, and you know, again, this is kind of a choice. I mean, like different different prisms could get different results, or would highlight different results. And this is this is a personal choice, but you know how I view it. And uh, there are you know what I'm trying to focus on on particular ideas or particular techniques, kind of. And um, so yesterday we talked about dimension reduction and space partitions, and today we'll uh, cover several more ideas. One of them being small dimension, number is some embeddings, and sketching. And later I'll talk about yeah, other things. OK. Uh, <clears throat> so let me start with small dimension. All right, so, uh, you know, high dimensional geometry, but, you know, what if dimension D is small, right? Uh, so, you know, what happens then? All right, so again, the goal, let's say, is to solve nearest neighbor search. OK, so uh, turns out we can solve one plus epsilon approximate nearest neighbor search with essentially near space and query time that depends exponential dimension. Right, this is uh, you know, something I mentioned yesterday. So you know, there is a bunch of work <coughs> uh, how to solve this. And uh, you know, it is OK if, say, dimension is really small. OK, uh, so. You know, if probably, you know, even if you plug five here, it doesn't look very favorable. But, you know, at least in practice, it kind of, you know, makes sense. Kind of. it, it works for the mission, which is small, like five, ten. Um, okay, so, you know, good. You know, but usually the mission D is not small. So, you know, in this data set, for example, it has 700 plus dimensions. Um, so, you know, what do we do then? Um, so, you know, one can, you know, kind of push it harder and say, what if dimension D is effectively small? You know, for some notion of effective. Uh, so here is one very simple example. So suppose our, um, uh, spa our space is d-dimensional, D is very high, but the points that we care about really like on a low dimensional subspace. Thank you. No, that's fine. Um, think. Uh, so it's on k-dimensional subspace where k is much smaller than D. So suppose five-dimensional. Right, so then, you know, obviously, you know, you can just focus on that subspace, solve nearest neighbor search there, and it's effectively low dimensional situation, which is good. Uh, but, you know, first of all, this is not a robust definition. So, you know, if you think in any kind of reasonable kind of practical setting, you know, your, your points will be slightly perturbed, there will be some noise. So them lying on k-dimensional subspace is really not, yeah, it's just not real, right? It's too, too non-robust. So, but, you know, kind of following this idea that, you know, let's define some effective dimension, there have been proposed a number of uh, definitions of uh, dimension, what, you know, like slightly more robust definitions, what it means to be effectively small dimensional. And uh, you know, some of them including air dimension, looking at things like doubling mention, which I'll mention in the next slide, things like, you know, manifolds, which are lower dimensional and which are smooth, and so forth. Okay, so let, let me, you know, let me really you know, focus on doubling dimension, explain what it is, and, you know, see what, what happens. Okay, so definition. So the definition is for a particular set of points S. I really don't care about which space it comes from. And I say that it has doubling dimension lambda if the following holds. Um, so consider a point P. So, you know, let me just do it by picture. So we have some point set. We take any point P, we take any radius R, we take the ball of radius r around p. And now we say that this point set has dimension lambda. If for any p and r, we can cover this ball by 2 to the power lambda balls of half the radius. OK, so I mean, it measures some kind of growth of a metric, right? Um, so this is definition and kind of, you know, for any kind of definition that tries to generalize something else, you know, it's good to do some sanity check and check that, you know, it corresponds to the old definition that you kind of you know, the way you expect it. In particular, if you take k-dimensional subspace of a very high dimensional space, you want it to be of, you know, this doubling dimension to be roughly k, right? And this is true. I mean, if you, if you take some subspace dimension k, which is essentially just k-dimensional real space, take any ball, 
rainy radius, you try to cover it by uh, balls of heavy radius. You know, it is you know, classic geometry to say that this is covered by, you can cover this by something which is exponential in the k number of balls. OK? You know, passes the same check one. Another thing that is you know, also good to kind of check is that if you have n points, there are, you know, n points in a ball is always coverable by n points, by n balls. Right? This means that dimension, this Lublin dimension, is always bounded by log n. So this kind of corresponds to the intuition that we have from Johnson and Strauss that you know, any point set should be effectively at most log n dimensional. Right, because we can, with very small loss in approximation, can induce to log n dimensions. So essentially, any n points, you know, maximum dimension should be log n. And this is what it says, right? For any n points, the dimension will be at most log n. Okay, so this is the definition. Very cool part about it is that it doesn't use any Euclidean geometry or anything. I mean, the definition at least, right? So it works for any metric space. Can you find it for any metric space? OK, so you know, assuming this dimension, so we have a point set. Suppose it has small doubling dimension. What can we do? Well, it turns out that you know, we can do some you know, better nearest neighbor search effectively as if it, is, if it were k-dimensional space. So one particularly nice example uh, that I like is from a paper by Indigen Aur, who said that, OK, suppose we have a doubling you know, lambda, so a point set of doubling dimension lambda in Euclidean space. So there is you know, a little bit more geometry. Uh, so then, you know, very cool part is that if you just apply the dimension introduction, the johnson liller strauss that I mentioned yesterday, you can just apply it on this point directly, and you can reduce into dimension k, which is order lambda, and you project it there randomly, and this works. Okay? So, you know, this is kind of, you know, one of the other applications of, dim of uh, dimension reduction. Um, so, you know, find it very cool. So, what does it mean to work? Uh, so you know we won't prove that for any two points, this uh, uh, the, the distance is very high concentrated just because we don't have enough k. But uh, what you can prove is the following: that if you consider contraction, so contraction means the distance you know uh, decreases via this map a lot. Uh, so this is called contraction. So you can prove that contraction of any pair, any pair of points from this point set, uh, won't happen. With uh, basically contraction happens with very small probability of any pair. Expansion, on the other hand, can happen with some constant probability. Okay, so we don't have a you know very good distance approximation guarantee for any pair of points, but we have these two uh, these two uh, guarantees, right? And what is you know cool about these two guarantees is that this is exactly good enough for nearest neighbor search, right? Uh, because contraction of any pair, we don't want that any of the far points, right, which are kind of not good answers, to come any closer to our query point. Uh, just a second. And uh, we don't want that our actual near neighbor goes too far away, right? And in some sense, you know, this has happened to has to happen for all n points. This has to happen for exactly one point. So it works. There's a question. Exactly. So this is this is exactly the point that I, I guess so far and successfully tried to, to convey, that it works for the purpose of nearest neighbor search. So what happens in particular if you look at what happens for two particular points, right? They won't contract with very good probability in something. Actually, for this, the entire set of points, the contraction won't happen for all the pairs with good probability. It won't, it's not going to preserve distances pairwise for everybody, right? It, it's just that it has asymmetric guarantees. It, it says something stronger about contraction than about expansion. And this is exactly the kind of trade-off that we need for nearest neighbor search. Right? You don't want the far points to get close, and there are many far points, so this has to happen with very good probability. On the other hand, the expansion, meaning that the actual near neighbor the expansion is the near neighbor, you know, the one point that you care about for the particular query that we have goes far away. This is expansion. But, and we need to guarantee expansion for just one point, the near neighbor. Okay?
Contraction means two point, the distance becomes smaller. Um, yeah, if you look at any particular two points, but if you take an entire point set, it, I mean, the proof is not simple proof. I mean, I can take it offline. But yeah, I mean, this is, this is exactly kind of the cool part of it, right? I mean, but, you know, it almost looks magical. Right? It's approximate. approximate. It's approximate. Yeah. So, sorry, I, I meant to say that all algorithms are approximate that I'm talking about. So, but I mean, you can get one perception approximation. Yeah. Okay, and uh, you know, so in some sense, you know, like once it's good enough for nearest neighbor search, you reduce to essentially effectively dimension lambda, and then you apply the low dimensional nearest neighbor search, and uh, you can. Uh, uh, you can uh, you can do this also for a bit three metric. So, sorry, just to answer your question. I mean, think about k-dimensional subspace, right? If you do projection into order k, if you do just results in order k dimensions, then you'll preserve the distances for all the points, entire subspace, infinite number of points. It's, it's just that in some sense you don't have to argue about endpoints. You effectively can discretize them and say you take some form of epsilon net and say that I have to only talk about exponential in k uh, points. So this is this is how a proof would look like for contraction. For expansion, it doesn't work. Uh, I can go later in detail. Okay. So for arbitrary metric, there are you know very cool algorithms. Uh, basically, navigating nets from Kraus-Geimer Lee, cover trees from uh, Belger, Zeimer, Kakadi, and Langford. Um, and, uh, you know, essentially the algorithm, you know, just to kind of give high level description, it is essentially, you know, data dependent uh, uh, recursive tree that partitions the space recursively into balls. And um, you can think of this like partitioning the space rather than, you know, using lines as we were doing yesterday, we are partitioning them using balls. Um, and um, the algorithm is slightly different uh, in the sense because it, it actually achieves linear space, uh, that the query time is exponential in the dimension lambda. Um, and this comes roughly because, you know, rather than following just one path down the tree, as it was yesterday, we'll follow several paths down the tree, which essentially corresponds to all the paths, uh, you know, of this, of this recursive partitioning that intersects the ball around Q of, you know, particular radius R that we care about. So, I mean, I you know, don't mean to describe the algorithm in detail. I mean, it's somewhat similar, at least in spirit, you know, from the perspective of this talk, from this high level perspective, it's, you know, somewhat similar in spirit to, uh, to the partitioning algorithms from yesterday. Okay, so, you know, this is small dimension. Um, so basically, you know, the, the, the point here being that, you know, you can, uh, you know, if, if you really don't like high dimension, you can, you know, redefine your dimension and you know, hopefully that, uh, hopefully the data has some more structure and it is effectively behaves as a low dimensional space. And then you can so solve nearest neighbor search uh, as effectively as if it were low dimensional space. And of course, this notion has appeared in, in many other contexts and, um, and you know, showed that many other algorithms, for example, are solvable as if effective dimension is this lambda as opposed to high dimension. Okay, and uh, here we come to second, uh, second idea or topic of today, which is embeddings. And this is really a very big field um, with uh, lots of connection to function analysis. Um, so there is a lot here. I'll just you know, probe you know, some places of this really big topic. Um, but you know, later I'll mention what, you know, what things I didn't cover. Okay, so, you know, it's, you know, general theory, you know, has, so basically, you know, big topic has, you know, big motivation. Um, so, you know, general kind of, you know, just again, taking a step back and saying, okay, so in general, you know, so far we mostly talked about Euclidean space, but, uh, and Hemming space, but, you know, in general we have many other uh, metrics and ways to measure similarity or dissimilarity between objects, right? Um, and um, you know, and you know, this is what we call a distance or a metric M. 
Uh, and, uh, you know, there are different computational problems that we want to solve under this metric M. Uh, so, you know, I mentioned we're having distance Euclidean distance, but there are other things like edit distance between two strings uh, that I'll mention later, or F mover distance, uh, or transportation, also called Wasserstein distance. Um, so these are, you know, form of distances or metrics. Uh, and, uh, you know, there are different problems. In particular, I was fo focusing on nearest neighbor search, but, you know, in general, there are even such basic questions and computing distance between two points or two objects from these metrics. Sometimes this is a hard question. Um, or diameter, closed pair, clustering, minimum spanning tree, and, and so forth, right? Um, and general, you know, so what, what do we do, right? So, you know, we already know some metrics like Hamming distance, Euclidean distance, where some of these questions are simple. You know, computing distance, for example, is, you know, simpler and right? you just linear, you know, compute it directly. And there is neighbor search and we've been focusing so far and kind of try to convey that, you know, in some sense, you know, there are solutions, you know, maybe, maybe they are not the best yet, right? But there are some very non-trivial solutions that, you know, get you somewhere. And we'd like to get this for other metrics. And, you know, what do we do, you know, kind of very computational scientific, uh, computational science, uh, computer science approach uh, to hard problems is, you know, first approach is to try to reduce to simpler problems that we already know how to solve, right? Um, so this is the picture that, you know, like, oh, we'll try to take some hard metric, you know, let's think of this as hard metric, um, you know, some maze, and reduce into something simple, right, which is, this is kind of Manhattan metric, right? Um, uh, so the idea is to map kind of a hard metric into simple metric, uh, in a particular, so that we reduce a problem under a hard metric, for example, nearest neighbor search under f over distance, uh, into simpler problem, which is, you know, a problem under a simpler metric, say nearest neighbor search under Hamming distance. Okay, so this is general view. Uh, and uh, this is the brute force approach, right, uh, that we'd like to be able to, to do, but it doesn't always work. Um, so, uh, so, you know, let me define this formally, what is, what is an embedding. So an embedding, you know, form formally is a map from metric M, you know, think of it as a hard metric, into host metric H, uh, which we think about it as being a simpler metric, such that for any points X and Y from the original one, the distance, you know, rho H, this is the distance in the new metric of the projected, of the, of the maps of the points, is approximated up to factor D, which here it is called distortion. But think of it as an approximation. Okay? Uh, and, you know, obviously if you manage to, so, so this is, you know, this is a reduction, but of a particular sort, right? It says that, okay, maybe we can take all this hard metric and reduce it into a simpler metric. And then all problems that we can solve under H, we can also solve under M, you know, assuming that this rho is nice and this D is small. Yeah, yeah, uh, uh, up to rescaling of row, right? I mean, if if metric H has natural rescaling, internal rescaling, you know, which usually it does, then you, you don't need to assume that. But yes, in general, you know, sometimes it doesn't happen. In general, you would put some factor, you know, Z here and here, right? So it, it, it so it doesn't matter, right? So for example, nearest neighbor is still preserved up to approximation D, for example. Okay, and uh, you know, again, you know, this is big theory. There is a lot of types of embeddings. First of all, you know, they come in all shapes and colors. Uh, so first of all, you know, what you map from which M into which host, you know, what is the distortion that you can get. These things can be randomized. So for example, you would achieve this guarantee only with some probability. Uh, another question is, you know, what time does it take to compute this function, for example? And, you know, like for different variants of this, we can, you know, all kind of metrics, uh, all, all kind of embeddings. For example, you know, something that we already have seen is dimension reduction, where we say we take one norm, say Euclidean space, and we map it into the same space, but of lower dimension. Um, and, um, you know, there is another, you know, another type is from one norm into the other. It turns out that you know, essentially the same proof that I showed for dimension reduction actually works to prove that you can embed Euclidean space into, into Manhattan space, Hamming space. Um, 
The other type, you know, kind of what I was trying to allude to on the previous slide is that you can try to embed non-norm spaces, um, things like edit distance or f-over distance, into a norm, like L1. Um, different way is to, uh, you know, another type of, of embeddings is to say that rather than talking about general spaces, I'll take a particular endpoints and a particular distance definition of these endpoints, so might not have any geometry whatsoever, and I'll try to embed it into L1, right? Or maybe, you know, it has some geometry like it is the shortest path on a planar graph. Um, and, uh, you know, this will be in the, in the next section, but, you know, sometimes H is not even a metric, okay? All right, so, you know, this is kind of, in you know, a general overview just to, you know, you know suggest what kind of things uh, do they exist? Uh, but let me, you know, wh what I want to, to tell you, essentially, you know, one particular embedding, just to give you a flavor of how these things work. So basically what we want to do is, you know, map hard metric into simpler metric that we already know how to solve, for example, or, you know, for which we have efficient algorithms. So here is one metric, you know, which is well, not a simple metric, and, you know, it's still kind of, you know, there are many parts of it that we still don't know how to do efficiently. Uh, so it is, it is a metric defined on sets, okay? Not on points, but on sets. Uh, so we have two sets A and B um, in some underlying metric space. So this is, say, green points and, and red points. And the distance between, the f over distance between these two point sets is just the, the cost of the minimum matching, right? So this is also called bichromatic uh, mean cost matching. Um, Okay, so which, wh what is the underlying metric space? Well, it can be just two-dimensional plane, as you know, the picture, uh, pictured here, but actually it can also be higher dimensional. Um, and you know, this is actually something, uh, you know, higher dimensional kind of underlying metric space sometimes has applications in image vision. So, you know, just to, just to explain to you, um, uh, so these are, you know, pictures of my alma mater. Um, it is probably hard to recognize uh, unless you've seen it before. Uh, so um, the idea is that, you know, yesterday I mentioned that, you know, you can take image and you take it as a bitmap and kind of compare it directly. And, you know, that's, you know, as you probably might have guessed, you know, it's not exactly the best way to measure the, the similarity or dissimilarity between images, right? So some of the more modern methods would say that, well, let me take, you know, uh, two images I want to compare, let me extract some you know, uh, key points or some corners, some particular points that I, that, you know, seem very specific to the image. So I'll, I'll uh, zoom onto them, I, I'll extract them, and I'll represent each of these as a high dimensional vector now. And uh, what I say that, you know, my cost, the dissimilarity between these two images is the earth mover distance of this cloud of rectangles versus this cloud of rectangles. Okay. So, you know, we, this is the definition. And now, you know, how do we solve nearest neighbor search under such a metric? Right. And uh, so, you know, what we'll do, we'll embed the search from over distance into L1, into my head and space, to incur some distortion, but, you know, we, we do what we can. Uh, and, you know, before jumping into embedding, you know, first of all, why into L1? For some, you know, one of the reasons is that at least as hard as L1. Um, so it, it uh, takes a couple of minutes to, to think about this, but you know, it, it is at least, you, you can embed uh, L1 into EMD essentially. So you can represent any uh, uh, basically Hamming space into in, in your over distance. So, you know, it is not simpler, so it can only be harder. Uh, and here is the type of, you know, theorem that you know, you'd prove for, <coughs> for embedding. Uh, so is that you can embed earth mover distance over, say, two-dimensional grid of uh, width delta, so this is integer grid, uh, into L1. I won't specify dimension, um, but um, it, it doesn't matter that much. Um, with distortion, which will be logarithmic in the size of this grid. Okay, and, uh, you know, good point is that time to embed will be kind of small. Um, and you know why do we why do we care? You know, we can this immediately implies nearest neighbor search. In particular, we'll get something like C log n approximation with this much space, which is you know 
subquadratic space and sublinear in n, the number of sets, uh, query time. Okay, I mean, these, these ones don't necessarily look particularly nice, but you know, this is the type of things that you get. Um, th think of this as, you know, this is basically the description of the set. So this is just, you know, how many hash tables we have, and this is just you know, the effective dimension of these of this sets. Okay. And uh, but I mean, in some sense, this this doesn't all all you know just give nearest neighbor search. It also gives you know uh, other artifacts like computing <coughs> Gershman over distance. So even computing Gershman over distance is between two point sets is not a simple task, and it is only very recently, uh, as of a year ago, that uh, there is a approximate near linear time algorithm to compute it. All right. But before that, essentially, the best algorithm to compute was more or less uh, by uh, getting this log delta approximation by via this embedding, right? Where you would just take the point set, you embed it into L1, and then you just compute the distance between these two embeddings. Uh, and actually, you know, there is a higher dimensional version of this uh, where you don't, you know, it's a higher dimensional grid. And uh, for that variant of f over, f over distance, computing the distance between two such high dimensional Mm, clouds of points is, you know, the best way we know. Uh, the best way we know how to do it is via this embedding. So embed into L1 and then compute the distance between the embeddings. Okay, and um, you know, in the next a few slides, I will be proving this embedding. Yes. Oh, so you're, you're you, you said briefly that there is now an algorithm that does this, that you can compute the end quickly. Yes, this one. Okay. I, approximately. Approximately, yeah. It, yeah it's a non-trivial algorithm. Um, so, yeah, I mean, this is stock 2012 result, right? Before that, it was the best linear time algorithm would get constant approximation. It was essentially using this type of ideas. OK. All right. So. Um, Okay, so let me, you know, so this is a high level overview of how the embedding roughly looks like. Uh, just, you know, to show that, you know, in the, in the end, even though the proof will be somewhat, you know, complicated, uh, the actual embedding looks very simple. So, so we have sets of size s in this delta by delta box. This is the box. Uh, and suppose we want to embed a set A. Okay, so this function takes each set, embeds separately, right? We, you know, the embedding. The embedding works set by set. Um, so uh, here is the point set A. So what we do, we take a quad tree, we randomly shift it. So imagine this is randomly shifted. And uh, now each cell of this quad tree will give a coordinate. Um, and this coordinate you know, in the embedding corresponding to cell C will just count the number of points in that cell. Right, so Basically, there will be a bunch of coordinates, but for example, for coordinates corresponding to this cell, this cell, this cell, and this cell, we'll have values 2, 2, 0, 1, one 0. Okay? So, quadri is actually recursive. So, think of this as, you know, recursively partition quadri. And we'll have cells, you know, we'll also have co uh, coordinates corresponding to cells of smaller cells. So, you know, you can compute exactly in each cell how many points there are. And it will be, you know, a bunch more coordinates. We just compute the number of points in each cell. And this is the embedding. Right? I mean, just starting with the right y3 and the right number of levels and everything. Uh, and log delta really comes from these log delta levels. Okay. Because this is, this is the, the number of levels that you'll have in part 3 that partitions with, with delta by delta box. Okay, and uh, if you have, uh, you know, another blue blue set, you know, you can compute the same and, you know, it will give some other embedding, right, which looks like this, right, just to give another example. So this is the embedding. Uh, and uh, essentially what one can prove is that, you know, if you have these embeddings, then there is a randomization, not that there is a randomization because of randomly shifting this quadri. Uh, so what one can prove is that the expected L1 distance between these embeddings for any for any points A and B is for any sets A and B the expected uh, expected L1 distance between the embeddings 
where the randomization is all over this random shift, is approximately equal to f over distance between a and b up to log delta approximation. Um, so you know this is you know what I'll try to kind of show. And uh, you know let me kind of you know how to go about this proof. You know uh, so here is here is one kind of general ap approach to proving this statement. Uh, so in general, we can view this, uh, you know, each level of a quad tree, in particular the highest level of quad tree, as partitioning recursively the EMD into smaller grids. So suppose these are our two sets, right? So, so we're just proving the statement for any A and B, the expected L1 distance between the bendings is roughly equal to the F over distance between the point sets, okay? This is, this is the claim to prove. So consider these points A and B, we have this random, uh, random quadri. So we, we can think about it as uh, partitioning, uh, as being computed, you know, as a sum of two quantities. One quantity, one type of quantity is F mover distance on each uh, smaller cell, right? Uh, plus F mover distance on kind of meta scale. Okay, so you know, essentially you, you take something, you know, big, uh, big, uh, uh, big box, you partition into parts, and then you say that, oh, my F over distance, you know, like the way to view about F over distance between two point sets is to see what happens in each small thing plus a high level view. Um, okay, and what we'll do, we will recursively uh, will recursively reduce this. So essentially, uh, so what we've just done here is we decomposed f over distance over a big grid into f over distance into smaller grids. And then you'll take, uh, so for example, each of these grids and decompose it further. Okay, and this is, this is the point of view that it essentially what the embedding does. Uh, and you know, in log n, uh, log n iterations will be down to grids which have, say, constant size, say, three by three. Okay, and just to you know, see what happens if f over distance is really kind of on a small grid, say, three by three, then uh, uh, say, suppose you know, it is really three by three, then you know, just counting the number of points in each in each of the nine uh, locations. And you know, taking this as an embedding, so basically we have a coordinate for each of these, uh, each, each of the nine locations, counting the number of points. If this is the embedding, this gives constant approximation. Right? Because you know, if for any points which are in the same location, it's better to match them. This cost us zero. And for any unmatched point, for example, here, so we can match the red to blue, which will cost us zero, so there is no loss. We can just, you know, essentially erase these points. There will be just points at these locations that are unmatched, say this red one. And it doesn't really matter where we match them because any matching to anything except here will cost us, you know, somewhere between one and, uh, say, the root uh, two, root, sorry, root. Eight. Um, I mean, it depends exactly what is the, the underlying entry, whether it is Euclidean distance or it's Manhattan distance, which doesn't really matter because this is two-dimensional space. Um, okay, so you know, basically, so we count the, the cost of matching in this three by three grid is really the number of of uh, points of essentially num the disparity of uh, number of points in each of the grid locations. And this embedding is counting exactly this. Okay, so you know the point being that you know once we reduce to grids of small size, say three by three, then we are done. You know we get constant approximation. Okay, so. So basically what, you know, what I showed you, this is kind of a base case of recursion, right? What I want to show you is the 
inductive step in some sense. Uh, so this is a decomposition lemma uh, due to index uh, that um, you know essentially proves this high level view that we take a big grid, we decompose it into a bunch of small grids plus a high level grid. All right, so this is the high level grid and these are kind of smaller grids. So there is one thing that I should mention that uh, you know, we will talk, you know, this is what this second E stands here. Uh, it stands for extended uh, F over distance. Uh, the idea being that, uh, you know, once we start, you know, something that I didn't mention from the beginning, that what happens if the point sets have different cardinalities? Um, right, so it is, it is not well defined. So this extended F over distance is essentially a way to define essentially define away this, this issue. Um, and uh, it will say that, uh, uh, so if we have A and B, say, and uh, say size of A is bigger than size of B, then this extended earth mover distance uh, will be basically mean cost matching uh, of uh, a subset A from a where uh, size of A is equal to size of B. So this will be MD between A prime and B. Plus, <coughs> essentially, the extra points times essentially max distance in grid. I mean, this is kind of very natural extension saying that, well, if the points as do not match, then all the points that, you know, are left unmatched will pay the maximal possible distance. Right? This is like in Barton, right? If you lost your card, then you pay the maximum trip cost, right? Um, okay, so, uh, so this is, I mean, there are two parts usually to these things. Proving, you know, we want to prove that this is approximately equal, right? So this means that we need to prove an upper bound and a lower bound, right? So this is a lower bound because it says that this will be the new cost, right? So this is the comp like one step of the decomposition where we say the cost of, you know, these EMDs plus the cost of this EMD is approximately equal to the original EMD between A and B. And these things corresponds to the cost of this, essentially, you know, one step of embedding. Uh, and so this A1, B1 are essentially corresponding to uh, sets uh, restricted to this cell. This is set restricted to this cell and so forth, right? So this is this sum. Plus this part corresponds to F over distance between uh, kind of high level view. Okay, so high level view is essentially I should mention uh, before is that high level view says that uh, we'll have a, a point a location for each of these cells and it just counts the number of points in in this cell right so this is what this big grid is right this high level view right as if as if we'd taken this cell and contracted into just one point okay uh, and the right way to compute this, uh, the, the cost of F over distance here is that we will, um, in the, the right scaling is to multiply this by K. What is K? The K is uh, the grid length of, of uh, this, uh, this sum. Okay. So think of this, uh, you know, if this is, this is delta, then k will be roughly delta by three, right? If we really partition into into just uh, three um, three by three grid, okay? Uh, roughly speaking, you know, why do we multiply here by k? Because matching a point, say, from here to here, should cost us something proportional to the length of the grid, right? not uh, not one. So this is, you know, if we if we have if we if we have something mismatching at a high level, you know, corresponding to this kind of meta grid, then any mismatch in a high level picture should cost us much more than any mismatch at a local scale. So this is where this factor K comes into. 
So, so this type of inequality is essentially lower bound on cost. I mean, there is an also an upper bound on cost, which in, you know, is kind of the, the, opposite, um, the opposite inequality. And uh, here on upper bound, you know, one can actually do this upper bound separately, saying that the cost of uh, F expected cost of r from over distance on, on this local view, essentially on each of these uh, grids, smaller grids separately, so the sum of these costs <coughs> is upper bounded by essentially f over distance between original sets. And also, again, this, the second term of the cost, basically the, the cost of matching the points in this meta grid uh, is also upper bounded by the original f over distance cost between A and B. Okay, and you know, just to, re just to repeat, the, the distortion will, will apply uh, by, f you know, by applying this decomposition recursively for log, log delta levels. Uh, so, you know, let me kind of give, you know, hints of proofs uh, of these parts. Um, so part one, the lower bound, basically this is what we want to prove that with extended f over distance on original points A and B, lower bounds, the cost of matching in each of these cells separately, plus the cost, plus you know the scaling factor, uh, the cost of matching in this meta cell, into meta grid, and uh, you know so we think about this inequality kind of what you want to prove, and what do you need to prove? You want to you know in general we want to lower bound this quantity, right? So this is what we care about, but one can view this slightly differently and say that. Well, what I want to do is I actually want to show that f over distance between A and B can be upper bounded by this, which means I want to construct an actual solution for f over distance that achieves at least uh, at most this cost, right? So I want upper bound. Uh, I want I want exactly compute what is this f over distance between A and B, but I'll show some matching between points A, between sets A and B, that uh, whose cost is upper bounded by this. Okay, so uh, essentially what I'll do is I'll say, okay, suppose there is some cost for doing this, right? This is the cost uh, for matching, you know, this uh, f over, you know, decomposed kind of f over distance. Uh, and uh, what I'll do is I'll instruct some matching from these, from these things that will give me a cost uh, of matching A and B, you know, bounded by this. Okay, it, it need not be, you know, the optimal cost, but you know, it is it is upper bounded by this. Okay, and how do we do it? I mean, basically, this you know, the, the general intuition is that this uh, f over distance already give us some partial match there, so we, they already me give us some matching, right? And we will just extract a matching for the entire point set by completing what happens, right? And uh, essentially, you know. There will be stuff that you know appear here, but essentially, you know, the intuition is really simple. It says that okay, I want to match points A and B, right? Either they are matched somewhere inside these point sets, and then I'm done with those points, or if they are not matched here, then we are in this extraneous part, right? These unmatched guys, right? And these unmatched guys will be matched. This means that they should be matched at high level somewhere, and for them we'll pay k. This is really the intuition. All right. So again, you know, just pictorially. So okay, suppose we have some point. We, we want a point from A. We need to match it to somebody. Um, so some red point. We we match it to some blue point. And you know, if you can match it inside here, then okay, this will come from the cost of matching inside this cell. Uh, but for somebody for something that is extraneous, right, for which we'll pay kind of the max the max grid length. Well, essentially, um, you know, it is it should be matched. Uh, it should be matched on this higher level grid, right, at the coarse level, because will be, you know, the number of points do not correspond here, right? So this is extraneous point, so it will have to be matched in this big grid, and in this big grid, for example, it is matched to, you know, some other points from another grid, and this is paid. This is, you know, you don't even need to read this, right? But you know, intuitively, this is paid out of this cost out of matching it at the high level.
Okay, uh, and again, I mean, don't need to follow the details of the proof. I just, you know, really want to kind of give you the flavor of the type of kind of floor bounds that, uh, oh, so the, the, the flavor of how these embeddings work usually. Um, so, uh, I mean, but we know that so far we have not, you know, at least to prove one inequality, we have not used randomization, right? So we have to use it somewhere. And uh, we are using it on the other side, in the upper bound side. In particular, saying that the expected cost of matching inside, um, inside each of these grids, say A1B1 and la la, uh, is essentially upper bounded by the cost of matching uh, sets A and B. And also, the cost of matching in the, this coarse level grid. This meta grid is also bound, upper bounded by this in expectation. Um, so, you know, the, the type, you know, the proof will work this way. Um, uh, so, fix a matching. Um, I mean, we, we have to somehow connect to the optimal solution here, right? So, we need to use, you know, proof saying that this can be upper bounded. We need to somehow use what is the optimal solution. On left hand side, on this, on the best matching between sets A and B. Uh, so let's fix a matching uh, pi that uh, minimizes the Erfman over distance between sets A and B. Right, so this is just uh, bichromatic matching, uh, and we will construct the matchings for f over distance on right hand side. So suppose this is the optimal matching of the sets of the two sets. Uh, so now we have imposed a randomly shifted grid. And what happens, right? So here we want to match each of the, uh, I mean, in, in, the lower, in the lower level grids, we'll, we'll have to do matching here and then here and so forth. So for this part at least, uh, the, the matchings, you know, we pay these green parts which are fully inside, which are not cut by, uh, uh, by the quadri. So basically, the pairs of points A and B that are under in this matching pi, if they, are, if they have not been cut by the, by the quadri, then they can be matched inside each cell, right? And they will appear in this cost. Uh, the main problem, so in some sense, you know, there is no harm done by, by this quadri. Uh, the, the main problem is that sometimes harm can be done by quad three, in particular, if it begins to cut uh, it manages to cut some pair that has been matched. So if there is a pair AB that is, m that is matched under this optimal uh, uh, matching pi, then its cost will appear, um, it, its cost will appear in this, you know, meta level grid, right? Um, and and the, the cost that we'll have to pay will be roughly proportional to the length of the grid, to this k. And uh, the problem is that, you know, you would expect that, you know, this happens only for, you know, we intuitively say like, oh, if the points are far away, these points, the, the, the points A and B are far away, this is, this is the case when it will be cut, right? So this is a very coarse level grid, right? I mean, this distance is very large, say. Right, this is say a third of the entire grid size, right? So saying that, well, if, if the two points are very close, you know, we are unlikely to be matched, uh, we are unlikely to be cut, right? So it should be fine, right? So it, it, it is only the pairs of points that are far away that will probably be cut by this grid, right? So this is a good intuition, but it is not absolutely correct because in expectation, it can happen, I mean, it could be that there are a lot of point, uh, pairs of points that are nearby, so their distance is small, but just a, f a fraction of them will be cut, essentially by kind of by expectation that there are just a lot of them. At some moment, some of them will be cut by this big grid. Uh, right, that was <coughs> a completion of the picture that you know points that are cut, they have to be matched in the big grid. And uh, so this is really the, the last slide of the of the analysis and will be done. Uh, so, you know, just to finish this, this part that, you know, what happens to these cut edges, right? What is the total cost that we pay for the cut edges? 
And uh, you know, again, the uncut pairs A, B are matched in, in the smaller cells. So in some sense, uh, we, we have the same cost on the left hand side and right hand side. So the main, the main problem comes from a pair that is cut by, the, uh, by this meta grid. And uh, here is you know, one computation that kind of very often comes in this kind of embeddings. Uh, it, it's very similar to the kind of space partitioning type, uh, type analysis that you know, have seen yesterday. But if you have a pair of points A and B, and suppose we are, so we are two dimensional, uh, suppose the distance on uh, x and y is dx dy. Uh, so if we are cut, then the contribution will be roughly proportional to the length, uh, to the side length of the, of the big grid, uh, which is k. Uh, so this is how much it will contribute to the cost that we are trying to upper bound. And, uh, and now you know, the question is, what is the probability that for a point which has dx and dy here, uh, basically the difference on x is dx, difference on y is dy, what is the probability that they are cut? And uh, you know, it's a kind of simple calculation that the probability that they are cut is essentially this, which, can, which is upper bounded by the distance, uh, by the distance between a and b and, uh, divided by k. Uh, so you know, not going through the calculation, the idea is that the probability that a point or that a pair of points is cut is proportional to their distance. Is proportional to their distance divided by k. And if this happens, then we are paying something proportional to k to this grid length. So the expected contribution. So I mean, this k, which can potentially be a big factor, um, essentially goes away. So the expected, so you know, while if, if it is cut, right, it can pay, it can be very small distance. And if it is cut, then it has to be matched in this coarse level grid where it will pay a lot, right? K, you know, think of K as large. But the probability that a small edge is, is cut is exactly inversely proportional uh, with K. So the expected contribution from this will be just proportional to the, to the length of the edge, maybe. So when, so this is the main kind of intuition of what's happening. Uh, anyways, so just to wrap up all this uh, embedding, in the end, uh, you know, you, you apply this recursively, you will obtain that f over distance between sets A and B will be the sum of f over distance of smaller grids in, uh, in expectation. You repeat it, uh, log delta times until you, you get down to very small grids, and you get log delta approximation just because you have log delta scales. OK, so this, this really was kind of a, you know, the most technical part of, uh, of the talk. So from now on, it will be more, much more high level. Um, so OK, so this was an embedding, right? Uh, so what else can we do, right? So you know, this is just you know, one particular embedding. People have thought about many more embeddings. So here, let me focus kind of on two types of metrics, actually, right? Uh, again, so these are kind of f mover distance. So this is you know, what I just showed you. Um, this is, there is a slight difference, but this is you know, log in the set size, essentially. Um, the same embedding, roughly. Uh, you know, one can do it uh, uh, even on sets over high dimensional spaces. Um, there is also you know, a bunch of work, for example, on embedding eddy distance. What is eddy distance? It's you know, just classical Levenstein metric between two strings, which says that how many insertions, deletions do you need to do to transform one string into the other. So for example, between banana and ananas, which is Latin for pineapple, um, is, uh, uh, is two, right? You delete B and insert S here at the end. Right? So it, it, uh, it, it measures, kind of, for example, the, the kind of mistype uh, it, it measures a form of dissimilarity between strings. If you think about the error model as being the number of uh, mistypes that one does, uh, it's actually kind of more used in, in uh, computational biology where you think about 
So uh, comparing DNA strings where uh, insertions, deletions uh, sim model the mutations, possible mutations. And uh, there are different types of edit distance. For example, uh, the classical edit distance, uh, you know, that you probably all know from the interaction to algorithms class, you know, can be embedded, say, in L1 with this much distortion. So this is somewhere between logarithmic and, and polynomial. Um, so somewhat better uh, results are obtained for edit distance if it is restricted to be edit distance between permutations. So think of this as you know, basically uh, no character repeats twice kind of situation, which, you know, for example, measures some, f some distance between rankings, for example. Um, block edit distance. And, you know, the general picture here is that, you know, this is, this is kind of good, right? I mean, we are getting logarithmic approximation you know, except this, this case especially, uh, we kind of can get logarithmic approximation by bending into L1. And for all, these, for all these metrics, essentially this means that we can get nearest neighbor search with parameters like in Euclidean space or, or Hamming space, uh, except that you know, the approximation is higher, is of this sort. Okay, uh, so this, this is cool. Um, and you know, here's the natural question is, can we do better, right? Why not? Um, so it turns out that one can prove non embeddability results, proving that if you, want to if you want to embed, you know, what is the best distortion, best approximation for embedding into L1, one well, can actually prove a lower bound and say that, well, the best, you know, you can only achieve so much. And this type of lower bounds do not care about dimension. So uh, irrespective of it, target dimension kind of. If you want to embed in 12.1, you know, many of these things will get uh, a lower bound, which is logarithmic. Okay? Uh, um, okay. All right, and uh, let me kind of, you know, indicate how these non embeddability results look like. Uh, so these are form of isoparametric inequality. So in general, you know, proving nearest ever search lower bounds has data structures is, you know, is a hard question. Uh, and uh, so, so these type of lower bounds are, you know, more geometric kind of statements. So we are talking only about metrics. They don't talk about computation, right? And uh, so they're very similar, where essentially in nature there are some form of isoparametric inequalities. Uh, and uh, you know, very often they are proven via what is called Poincaré type inequalities. And let me show you how this Poincaré type inequality looks like. Um, so by this, you know, let me state a you know, very classic theorem by Enflow, which says that if you want to embed, say, Hamming cube of dimension d into Euclidean space of any dimension, then you must incur distortion, which is root dimension, root d. Okay, so if you ever wondered whether you can, you know, do this embedding of, of Hamming space into Euclidean space, then the answer is no, unless you incur very high dimension, which is root d. And how roughly the proofs looks like, and you know, this is, you know, like at least the outline of the proof is inspired by, uh, by for analytic lower bound via Kot Naor. Uh, so you know, so what do you do? You, you kind of prove by contradiction. You say suppose f is the embedding. You know, f is some embedding of, of this Hamming cube into Euclidean space. Um, so usually you go around proving such lower bounds by constructing two distributions over pairs of points. And think of this as uh, one distribution is over close pairs of points or edges. Uh, for example, you take a random y and x is just uh, one random coordinate flip. Right, so this is, this is a distribution on pairs of points. And think of this as close because these pairs of points are very close to each other, are a distance one. Another, uh, the upper distribution is essentially over far points or diagonals, uh, where you take, say, x and y are random. In this situation, you know, why we call them far? Because we essentially incur the maximal distance, which is omega d. And the proof goes via two steps. In one step, you are saying, you know, essentially this intuition that one is close and another is far, that the expectation of a distance over close pairs is upper bounded by order d of the ex 
sorry, it should be 1 over d, um, uh, of the far pairs. And uh, uh, part 2, let, let me just manifest this quickly. OK, this is the right one. Um, so um, yeah, basically, we're saying you know, these, these are short. On the other hand, we're saying that if under this map f you know, that we hypothesize that exists, uh, the, the edges must be long. right? I mean, we, we, we prove a lower bound of omega 1 over root d. Essentially, you know, this type of claim is also called short diagonals. Right, so, so there are two parts, right? I mean, one saying that, you know, in the original metric, these, you know, the close things should be really close and far things should be really far. Uh, and in the target metric, what happens is that, you know, one way to see it is that diagonals have to be short. Okay, and, uh, you know, this type of claim, for example, you know, cut number short, but you know, this is very simple to prove by essentially writing out this function in, in, in for an analytic basis. It, it's a few lines proof. Right? Um, and uh, note that you know, basically, for these two things to to live together, this means that function f has to you have a distortion of root d. Okay. And, but you know, this is a general type of, of lower bounds. I mean, a lot of these non embeddability results look like this. I mean, you find some distributions and you prove these two steps. OK. Question, yeah. Right. So yeah, let me show you one. Uh, oh, you, sorry, you didn't understand which part? How the second statement is proven? Right. So the second statement is uh, so here is actually this is what Amphilo proved. Um, so in Euclidean space, for example, if you have four points, any four points, then the sum of diagonals is upper bounded by the sum of edges. So this is, I mean, this is kind of like the type of geometric things that one would prove. Yeah. So it's an embedding with distortion, let's say, capital D. Right. So now, where is cap capital D should appear in this last line, no? Uh, no, 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 no. So this is, you know, note that F appears both here and, and here. What it essentially says is that any set of, so take, take our Hamming cube under this function F, it maps into some 2 to power D points in the Euclidean space. So there is some <coughs> inequality which really uses the uh, geometry of Euclidean space, uh, but you know some linear inequality on the distances between these two points, be between sorry these uh, two quantities. Uh, so to complete the proof uh, for dimension, is uh, what what you'll do is uh, you know. So you have this EC on you know F. You say that this is at least omega uh, omega one over root d of expectation over far pain, so this f stuff, right? And uh, essentially, now you are using that you know if f uh, has some distortion, so suppose f is uh, uh, non-contracting, then this would be expectation over close of the original distance, right? And this should be at least expectation f over original 
times some distortion. So let, let me put distortion here. Sorry? Right, yeah, sorry, one over root d here, right? And for these, to live together with this inequality, we need to set uh, d to be uh, root, uh, root dimension. Right, so these are two inequalities that go different ways, right? Uh, so, you know, going forward, you know, okay. <coughs> so these are lower bounds into L1. Um, so we, we can take this offline question if, I mean, if it's still confusing, okay? Uh, okay, so, uh, so okay, L, L, you know, L1 is one host space, right? I mean, can we embed into some other host spaces where we can do, you know, good stuff? Uh, so what is a good host space? Uh, one is that you know should be algorithmically tractable. Basically, you know it, it, it's not it's not worthwhile to embed into something that is hard, right? We want to embed some somewhere where say we have good nearest neighbor search, and two is it's rich. You know it's uh, we can embed into it. Uh, so for example, you know basically yesterday we've seen that you know for Euclidean space or Hamming space we can do you know, good enough nearest neighbor search. Unfortunately, you know, just indicated that you know we are not rich enough to to be able to to host these spaces with very good distortion, right? So there is a logarithmic lower bound. So one can consider some other things where you know variations of this L two L one where you know they are still logarithmically tractable. For example, one can consider essentially the, the space of point of real space, so squared L two, let's call it, where we have real space with distance which is Euclidean space squared. Right, so you know this essentially means that we have roughly the same nearest neighbor search, maybe you know up to squares in, in the distortions, and uh, <coughs> you know it is it is richer, you know it, it gives us more power than a two and n one, right? Uh, unfortunately, it is still uh, it's still not rich enough. So you know for this kind of uh, you know at least for this t type of metrics, later on you know we've proven that. Uh, you know, by there are something that is called communication complexity that I'll mention a bit later. But you know, essentially, this kind of lower bound still hold even for these more uh, more general or slightly richer spaces. So you know, they are slightly richer, but they are still not rich enough. Okay, so then the question is like, okay, well, well, what's next, right? And um, you know, so here, you know, I should, uh, I should. I should say the L infinity story. Uh, so this is something that is uh, on the other kind of end of the spectrum where it is rich. So, so L infinity story, this is a norm where the distance, you know, real space, the distance of the two points is the maximum difference on the coordinates, right? So it is another distance, you know. So, so you know, think of this as, as an aside. Uh, what happens here? So the really interesting part here is that you can embed any metric on endpoints into L infinity of dimension n, exactly. Uh, so you know this this sounds like good, right? I mean it's it's really rich, right? And uh, okay, we also need nearest neighbor search for this, right? And I didn't mention it before, but uh, there is a very nice algorithm that says one can solve nearest neighbor search for for L infinity with approximation which is double logarithmic in dimension. So I, I won't dwell into this, but uh, but you know this is what is known. So in some sense, if we can embed into an infinity, then we're pretty good, right? And uh, the problem is that you know if you have n points, embedding into dimension n is not really good, right? So if only to take our point and to embed it will take time n, then you know all the improvements on nearest neighbor search just do not make sense, right? You take linear time in your data set just to map your point into an infinity, right? So the question is, can we do this with smaller dimension? 
right? So we say, okay, you know, you can embed endpoints into an infinity of dimension n. Maybe there is some dimension reduction result or something. Maybe we can directly embed this into a smaller dimension. Uh, the answer is that, you know, for some spaces we can actually embed directly into an infinity and use this type of result to get good nearest neighbor search, things like Hausdorff metric. But in general, this is not possible. And uh, it's not possible even for, for cube. So if you take a cube, uh, the 0, 1 to power d, then to embed this, you know, the, the dimension that you need to embed the entire cube will be roughly exponential in d. So, uh, so you know, to kind of, uh, to conclude kind of this, this discussion is that if you want to embed into low dimensional infinity, then it, you know, it is algorithmically tractable, but it is not rich enough. You can embed into high dimensional infinity, which is rich enough. You can embed anything into it, but unfortunately, it is not algorithmically tractable. Right? And uh, this is kind of, you know, the setting. Uh, and uh, the cool part is something, um, something that I find surprising is that combination of these things sometimes works much better than each part separately. So this is the type of thing where, say, the sum of components is much more than, uh, the combination of components is more than the sum. Uh, so, okay, so let me kind of, you know, show you, you know, one such combination. Uh, so meet our new host. This is how it looks like. Uh, and, you know, what it is is really kind of combination of L1, L infinity, and L2 squared, uh, and each is of low dimension. Um, and, you know, what does this combination mean is, you know, think of this as, you know, L1 is just, you know, standard L1 metric. What is L infinity of L1? Think of this as your, your points are now matrices of dimension 2 by 2. Uh, to compute the, the distance between two, you subtract the matrices, you know, point by point. You take L1 norm of each row. You get a bunch of numbers. You take L infinity of the, of the resulting numbers. Right, so this defines L infinity of L1. Now you can go a step further. You can define square L2 of, uh, you know, composed of this. So this will means that, you know, now we have these sheets of matrices, so we have three-dimensional thing, right? And, you know, basically you, you, know, you do the obvious thing. Uh, you first do L1, then infinity, and then you have a bunch of numbers. You take L2 square, which is, you know, the sum of squares of differences. Uh, so this is some, you know, crazy looking, uh, norm, and so you know, generally call it iterated product space. Uh, so you know, why, why you know, why shall we care about this crazy thing? Uh, well, because we can, uh, uh, and wh what we can is uh, two things. One is that we can embed, say, Ulam, uh, Ulam metric. So Ulam is just edit distance and permutations into this thingy with constant distortion constant approximation, uh, where each of dimension with alpha, beta, gamma is uh, proportional to the length of the string, of the original string. And part two is that uh, we can do very good, uh, you know, nearest neighbor search, well, reasonable nearest neighbor search. In particular, you know, there is a result saying that for any t iterated product space, basically t is free here, let's say, or two, it depends how you look at it, but you can get uh, log log n approximation with near linear space and sublinear time. So, you know, the type of result that we are getting for nearest number search, say for Hamming space. And, uh, you know, just combining this together, uh, this means that you can obtain nearest number search for Ulam with log log n squared approximation. And, uh, the, you know, just, just to repeat the point is that for each of these components separately, either, you know, L1 or L infinity or uh, squared L2 of the corresponding dimensions, there is a logarithmic lower bound for embedding into each component separately. So somehow, combination of them gives you much more power, right? So essentially, this says that, you know, this type of iterative product spaces are rich and algorithmically tractable. So, you know, as you can see, these are, like, you know, relatively recent results, so, you know, still not necessarily fully absorbed. Um, uh, so, okay, so, you know, I'll mention that slightly uh, later again, but, you know, here we're coming to essentially uh, the last topic, which is sketching. Um, 
uh, which you know essentially you know already the previous uh, uh, you know this this type of you know uh, combining these uh, these norms together and getting you know something more powerful should already kind of lead to the idea is that like well you know how far can we go and you know maybe the, the distance that we compute at the end doesn't need to be very structured like L1 or L2, but maybe something more general. So basically this is sketching can be viewed as a more computational view on these embeddings. So what happens is that you know embeddings, we said that we have some crazy space there. We embed into say Hamming space or Euclidean space uh, via this map F, and this map you know is um, uh, say approximating uh, approximates the distance, and after this map, where you know maybe computing the distance between x and y was hard, after we do this map, computing here uh, the distance new distance is very easy. So in Euclidean space, you know, it's this formula, right? So you know the sketching says like, well, rather than doing this, you know, according to concrete formulas, kind of, how about plugging in a computational procedure, right? So which will take essentially this f of x, the embedding f of x, and, well, f of x and f of y, and then apply some computation, and this computation will, uh, uh, will give us, you know, a distance or approximation of the original distance. And uh, just because we're talking about computational things, you know, it's more preferred to think about this not as real space, but, you know, something that is, has a number of bits, right? Uh, so this is, this should be kind of more, kind of, correct definition of what it is. And, uh, you know, of course, this comes with pros and cons. I mean, this is something more general. So first con, you know, first downside of this is that rather than, you know, if previously we were mapping into, say, Euclidean space, we had a lot of structure. Once we map into something that is, you know, think of this as computational space, we have much less structure now, right? Um, so, you know, have to be attentive. Uh, the pros is that, you know, we have more expressibility, so perhaps we can obtain better, uh, better approximation or smaller dimension. Um, so, uh, and this can be seen also as, you know, functional compression scheme. Um, in terms of time, let me not go into that. Uh, so why, in general, I want to, you know, say there are, you know, three reasons to do that. One is that uh, we can do uh, we can do more than what we could do with embeddings. Uh, so, you know, this more expressibility helps. Uh, part two is that uh, it's actually a waypoint to get embeddings. So not only it is, I mean, more expressible, but it, it is, you know, it helps to think about it, uh, even if we want to get embeddings. And part three is that uh, well, the theory of, of sketching connects um, the very beautiful uh, theory of communication complexity. Okay. Um, so it turns out that uh, I have uh, less time with slides. Um, so let me, uh, I, uh, so I'll have to skip some of them. Uh, so one, you know, part for part one, the point being that we can do dimension reduction into L1 uh, by doing these these sketches. Uh, so the type of results, you know, is very similar to dimension reduction in Euclidean space. So we have a linear map into log n by epsilon squared dimension, except that at the end, after this map, we do not compute L1 distance, as what a real dimension reduction would say. We do some kind of computational procedure. And how this map looks like, it, it looks exactly how I suggested yesterday it, it should look like. We are multiplying x by some uh, matrix where each element is, is chosen from one stable distribution, which is Cauchy distribution. You, you know, essentially, you know, L1 version of Gaussian distribution. This is its distribution. And this computation procedure, rather than taking, say, L1 norm of this, takes median. This is your computational power that you gain. And then you can prove a lemma of this sort. Yes, Yesterday is your square root k, right? Sorry? Yesterday you knew slice is square root divided by square root. Yeah, because we're carrying about L1. Now we carry, uh, sorry, L2, right? Now we're carrying L1. Uh, so point two about sketching is that uh, it is actually a waypoint to get embeddings. Right, so in fact, you know, just 
just coming back to this embedding into, into these iterative product spaces. So the cool part is that you know, this kind of embedding was really obtained as a, essentially geometrization of some algorithmic procedure. So there are some algorithms for computing Ulam in more local way, we, you know, some nice characterizations that actually came from uh, you know, the field of sublinear or local algorithms, basically property testing and streaming algorithms. And uh, you know, this embedding could be seen as essentially geometrization of this, right? So, so one had to take this characterization, essentially think about this as a form of load up circuit that you know, maybe at, you know, at the beginning would do some kind of sums between certain things, right? Then the infinity, then this uh, sum of squares. And uh, you would represent the distance between permutations as this load up circuit. So this, this gave you kind of computational power. And then you take this, this computational procedure and you would geometrize it. Essentially, you'd represent it as computing some kind of norms. Uh, so this is how this roughly looks like. Sorry for skipping it. Uh, I just want to mention that uh, finally, you know, all, all this theory of sketching has connections to communication complexity. And uh, what is communication complexity? Communication complexity is the old of Alice and Bob. Right? Uh, so, how many of you have seen Communication Complexity? Oh, okay. Um, not as many as I thought. Um, so, this is uh, something introduced by Yao in 79. It is a, a communication model where we have, okay, Alice, Bob. Uh, they have some inputs, say X and Y. Um, and they have to solve some problem, right? For example, for us, the problem would be, you know, given some metric, we want to distinguish whether the distance between x and y is smaller than r or bigger than approximations times r. So you know, communication complexity is a much more general kind of type of problems, right? I'm just uh, making it particular for us. And it's two-party uh, two -party protocol, basically. What, what happens here is that uh, these two players uh, are communicating, transmitting bits, and we're actually counting the number of bits, and we need to solve this problem. Right, so I mean, one way to do it is for Alice to send entirely X, this X to Bob, and Bob would compute it. Uh, exactly, but this takes too much communication. We try to do it in much less communication than this. Uh, you know, just to make sure this is shared, uh, we have some shared randomness. Um, and sketching is really, you know, it's, it's a simplified form of this communication where uh, basically, Alice and Bob produce a sketch of x, sketch of y. So think of this as this big F of x, big F of y. We send it to a referee, and the referee lo looks at this sketch, runs this computational procedure, and essentially computes it. Uh, computes the answer. And the good part is that, you know, so this is something that has been studied. Uh, so uh, in particular, there is very rich theory about it. I mean, there is no way I can list all the papers here. So I'm, I think, you know, introduced by Young 79, there is a book about it. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, so there are some notable examples. Uh, I, will, I will have to, uh, uh, so I'll skip them. Um, uh, so at least for the video, we'll be there. Uh, but uh, so there are, you know, people have thought about this uh, for, for uh, standard norms. Um, this, uh, you know, has very good connections to nearest number search, um, has very nice connections to uh, embeddability, and there are still questions that are open. Uh, and uh, I, I really kind of, you know, allow myself to skip it because I, I, I hope that uh, Graham Kormody will talk more about sketching and uh, communication complexity um, and uh, streaming. Um, so one thing that, uh, you know, I didn't talk is there are things that I'm not covering here. Um, again, you know, if one were to take a different prism, would see some other things. Um, so again, uh, sorry for skipping this. So I wanted to highlight a very cool algorithm by Greg Valiant for, for closest pair, which uses matrix multiplication to actually beat what we could do previously with uh, LSH type algorithms. No, this, this is the description of the entire algorithm. Sorry uh, for skimming it. 
uh, I just want to just uh, give a you know say a few words about uh, this slide in particular things that I didn't talk about and there are a lot of them and uh, one of the big things that I that I skipped uh, in this talk is about embedding uh, you know a, a big part of embedding theory where we talk about embedding um, fixed finite matrix maybe with some structure into norms like L1 and this is very very useful in optimization questions uh, for questions like sparse scar. Uh, so first of all I'd like to uh, point out the paper of uh, Linia Lono Rabinovich who essentially introduced the metric embeddings to theoretical computer science literature and uh, they showed that one can use uh, uh, what is called uh, Burgain lemma um, uh, which appeared in functional analysis literature to solve sparse cut with log and approximation. So sparse cut is, you know, is an optimization question. Uh, and, uh, you know, there is a bunch of other results that uh, you know, show that different forms of embeddings are useful for optimization questions. Um, and there is, you know, uh, there is actually a very good um, document with uh, open questions collected over the years by uh, Jerry Matushek and, uh, and Asaf Naor. Uh, that is the link. And uh, let me just finish. You know, essentially, we've uh, concluding what we have seen um, in these two lectures. Uh, so what we have seen is high dimensional geometry seen through the prism of nearest neighbor search. And uh, uh, we, in particular, we've seen you know, a bunch of ideas, uh, several, uh, you know, what I view as core ideas, at least from this prism. Uh, so yesterday we've seen dimension reduction, space partitions, and today we also seen, you know, what do we do? You know, can you redefine dimension? What if the data set has effectively small dimension? Embeddings, the theory of reductions between different metrics and norms, sketching the more computational view of embeddings, and there is much more that unfortunately I didn't have uh, time to cover. Thank you. So we do have time for a couple questions. Question there. So I wonder whether there are simulation studies to show all your older calculations actually pan out in, in real simulations? What? Don't no. worry about the constants in front of your uh, orders. Right. So some of the algorithms, you know, more, are more practical than others, right? Uh, where some are more impractical than others, right? Uh, so in particular, the embedding for f mover distance that I showed is actually practical, and people have implemented it and ran it, right? And even the high dimensional versions uh, are very similar to what is called the pyramid match kernel. Um, so I mentioned the name there. So there's a few people from MIT. I mean, hold on. Hold on. Um, so including people like uh, Christian Grauman and Trevor Darrell who used that kind of embeddings to construct uh, better indexing for, for, for image search. Um, but you know, some algorithms do have you know, bad constants that are not practical. So some of them, you know, for example, edit distance, at the moment I do not see, you know, the things that I mentioned are not practical, unfortunately. But I mean, maybe these are just for first steps. I mean, more is need to be done. Other questions? Yes. In, in most of the things that you mentioned today and also yesterday, uh, maybe except for something on the last slide, all the randomness that was introduced into the system and the guarantees came from the random um, construction of the right. functions of your embeddings. Um, and it's related to a comment that, uh, that Tom made yesterday. Uh, so at the, at the end of the day, you have to design a system cheap or, or some software. So in the real world, you, you design something. Right. Then you just hope that uh, that uh, the data which is fixed and, and you don't know what it is uh, will somehow I mean somehow you hope that everything is going to be going to be okay. Right. Um, so I was wondering if, if you know uh, any of studies or other things in the real world how to handle these type of uh, problems. So. Uh, uh, let, I mean, I'm not fully sure I understood the question. So you're saying that, you know, what do we do if you have real data sets? Is, is, is it a one way to pro phrase the question? Well, or? You in the real world when you are forced to design a system? Right. A system, not, like a, not like a random one which you kind of uh, right. give good guarantees on the randomness of your construction, but you have to just do one construction. Oh, I see, see. Okay, now no, 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 I understand. Uh, so, I mean, it, it depends on what is the kind of, you know, how much adversality there is, right? Uh, so, 
you know, in, in practice for many of the things, you know, you just pick some randomness and and you are done, right? Sometimes it's random, I mean, sometimes, for example, for nearest neighbor search, for example, rather than picking random nice people actually in practice do slightly different that I, you know, mentioned towards the end, is that you look at the data and, for example, you don't do random directions, but you partition by PCR, for example. And um, this is more data independent, first of all, right? But, so but then you don't use as much randomness, right? So there are a few answers here. You know, first, you know, just, you know, pick some randomness and hope for the best. And, you know, if your system does not react adversarially, right, then, you know, most of the time, good, you know, bad things won't happen, right? Um, and uh, the second answer is, um, I mean, in some sense, at the end, in, in practice, kind of, most of the time, you say, okay, I, it won't work for, you know, maybe 5% of the, of the inputs, right? And this is partly comes from the, uh, from the randomness part, partly comes, you know, being too data dependent and, you know, losing some guarantees. Um, if, if it's more adversary, so in some settings, so for example, in this, in, in streaming, for example, uh, it can become more, um, uh, it can become more adversarial and then the answer sometimes changes a bit. Uh, so you have to be more careful about how to use the randomness and maybe sometimes re-randomize. But, you know, for nearest number search, you know, as far as I know, most of the time kind of people don't care, you know, just do it and hope for the best. Okay, yeah. and, and another follow-up question, which is the other side. Uh, Hedeming uh, works in which the data is random? Uh, there has been some, but not as much as one would hope for. Uh, so, I mean, it is a good question. I mean, for example, for nearest neighbor search, we don't really, n so there are some results, and I, I guess I, I actually yeah, skipped from one. one. Uh, yeah, so for example, Greg Valens result, I mean, it, it does give a much better closest pair, well, theoretically at least, uh, for, uh, for closest pair, and, you know, there it, it assumes random point set. Though, you know, the belief here is that for most of these things, I mean, in high dimensional uh, situation, Random case is more or less the hard case most of the times. Mm -hmm. So for nearest neighbor search, you know, even though we don't have formal proofs, but you know, kind of my feeling is that in many of the cases, random situation is the hardest situation, where it is close to the hardest situation. So one has to be careful what it means to be random data set. So from f because of that, people kind of more said, well, this was part of the motivation to define things like doubling dimension, where you say, okay, let me try to look at the data and see if it has additional properties, and, you know, I'll, I'll prove my guarantees as a function of these properties. And if it doesn't look like this, then you say, well, this is not what I can. So, yeah, usually, usually I mean, like, it's, uh, like, there is a type of kind of, a type of, type of thought kind of here that I find very convenient, that, I mean, you design your algorithm to be always correct, or at least, you know, in randomized sense. Uh, and if it has this good property, for example, it has doubling dimension lambda, then the query time will be dependent uh, on this lambda. If it doesn't satisfy this property, the query time will be larger. So essentially, you, you always have the correctness guarantees, but you have this additional guarantee saying that if your data set is nice also, that you'll actually have a good query time. If it is not as nice, you know, you, you might, you, it might degrade to something worse. Yeah. yeah. And for many algorithms, you can do that, right? And, and this is cool. So, so in some sense, it's a scratchable guarantee. Right, depends on the data set, right? It's, uh, but you always guarantee something at least, right? Uh, there are other questions? One, one quick last question, and then we'll break. I yeah, just want to mention we actually used this great idea in a remote sensing project about 10 years ago and worked quite well to combine with a uh, support vector machine because we want to reduce it on sample size. Oh. And you can also prove that uh, when you have smooth functions in terms of minimax rates, you don't lose much. Mm -hmm. Great. So, um, yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, the, the, you know, the great things have been ap yeah. applied. Yeah, like I, I've seen a number of very nice work that used it, yeah. Okay, let's thank Alex for his three hours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.